Coming Back is a listener-supported podcast. If you like the show and want to see it reach more grieving ears and hearts, support Coming Back on Patreon at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. My Patreon supporters get exclusive access to weekly grief journaling prompts and live grief hangouts with me. Pledge for as little as $1 per month and change or cancel your support at any time. Join this growing behind-the-scenes community now at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. Thank you so much for listening to Coming Back. Just one more thing, grief growers. Do you ever feel trapped, stuck, or silenced in the aftermath of loss? Are you struggling to figure out who you are now or what your life is made of now that death, divorce, or diagnosis has steamrolled through? Whether you're trying to cultivate deeper self-compassion, figure out where grief belongs in your life now, or simply feel like you have more room to breathe, the three words that your heart needs to hear are permission to grieve. Permission to grieve is the title of my latest book, a tribute to the three little words that changed how I saw myself and my grief after the death of my mom. I know it has the power to change how you see yourself and your grief in whatever loss you're facing. You can find Permission to Grieve now on Amazon. Give yourself more grace, space, and room to breathe in the aftermath of loss, because we could all use a little more Permission to Grieve. Hi there, and welcome to Coming Back, a podcast about coming back to life after death, divorce, diagnosis, and more. On today's show, I'm speaking with artist, author, and greeting card designer Joanne Fink about the death of her husband Andy and how his death impacted who she is as a person, as well as how she expresses herself as an artist. If you've ever sent or received a sympathy card, you will not want to miss this conversation. Also this week, I'm reading the final chapter of my new book, Permission to Grieve. I'm Shelby Forsythia, an intuitive grief guide and author who speaks, writes, and teaches powerful truths on grief and loss. My mom's death in 2013 set me on the path to becoming a lifelong student of grief, and I use what I learned to help others find direction, get support, and cultivate radical self-compassion in the aftermath of loss. Because even through grief, we are growing. Let's get started. Hi there, grief growers, and welcome to another episode of Coming Back. Thank you so much for joining me today. Just a quick reminder here at the top of the show that our next live grief support call is happening on Monday, November 25th. This is just a few days before Thanksgiving, so if you'd like to get together with people from all over the world who just get what it's like to grieve... I would love to welcome you for our hour-long conversation. There is no fancy technology required to join, and of course, all losses are welcome. To access the link to join us live on November 25th, simply pledge to support this podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. All pledge levels receive an invitation to join us live on November 25th, and when the clock strikes 8 p.m. Central Time, just click the link to pull up our private chat room on YouTube. I look forward to seeing you there and holding space for your grief as we enter the often dreaded holiday season. You can find a link to my Patreon page where you can pledge and join our grief support call on November 25th in the show notes. So this week, grief growers, I want to share the final chapter of Permission to Grieve with you. This is a short clip that gives me chills every time I read and listen to it, because for as much as all of the truths that I wrote in Permission to Grieve are helpful and needed, This last chapter is the message that my heart really needed to hear after my mom died. It speaks of this reuniting with the self when we call grief home through permission granting, and that's just so incredibly powerful to me. Listen in. Wrapping up. Permission to Hope. I wrote this book because it is the permission slip I wish I had in the aftermath of my mom's death. I hope it has provided you with some insight, breathing room, and validation in your own loss. I hope you start giving yourself permission not only to acknowledge and honor your grief, but to give it room to speak, move, and grow with time. Society doesn't give us permission to grieve, but we can. The power to reclaim the grief which already inherently belongs to us is ours. 
no one but you is stopping you from saying yes to the experience, the identity, and the action of grief. You have that power. No one can take it away from you. I will never promise you that this road is easy. Granting myself permission to grieve opened me up to more heartbreak, agony, and shock than I had ever thought I would experience. But here's the thing. In granting myself permission to grieve, that heartbreak, agony, and shock became mine. I saw them and held them as my own and saw their root, my grief, as my own too. And that calling home of grief became my lodestar and loss. I was no longer a fragmented, self-abandoning griever, denying and resisting the reality of my life and my grief. I was a willing participant, albeit in a crying and raging and rumbling way, in my life again. I stopped holding myself and my spirit at arm's length. I picked myself up off the floor. I re-engaged with my broken heart. I let the wolf out of the basement. And that reconnection with my grieving self is something I wouldn't give up for anything. When we refuse ourselves permission to grieve, we shut off a vital piece of our heart that needs seeing, expressing, and loving. A wounded child, a raging wolf, an injured spirit. This is society's teachings of life rejection and self-abandonment at work. When we give ourselves permission to grieve, we embrace the child, we release the wolf, we heal the spirit. We run towards what scares us most, only to find that it is ourselves. And it's not so much scary as it is afraid. And we don't want the fear to go away as much as we want the fear to be seen, heard, and wholeheartedly loved. Permission to grieve helps us pull our grief into ourselves instead of pushing it away. Permission to grieve calls us home to ourselves. It brings us back to where we belong. And it reminds us that we are safe, sound, and secure even when everything around us is falling apart. What is cast out is retrieved from the garbage. What is shamed and belittled is summoned to the center to be nourished and fed. What is pressed down and forced out is welcomed back in all of its magnificent grieving glory. You have permission to grieve. You have always had permission to grieve. Claim it. It has always been yours for the taking. You are seen, known, and loved beyond measure. By me, and by you, too. Because even through grief, we are growing. If this clip resonated with you in your grief, please purchase a copy of my new book, Permission to Grieve, now on Amazon. There is so much more to the book than just what I've shared here on the podcast for the past 11 episodes, and I know that whatever you're grieving, you could use a little more room and permission to grieve in. Also, the holidays are coming up, so if you'd like to buy permission to grieve for a friend or family member this season, I would be so honored. You can find a link to permission to grieve in the show notes. Up next, I'm talking to Joanne Fink about the death of her husband, Andy, and how his death changed the way she creates art in the world. Grief is setting sail twice on the 2020 Bereavement Cruises to join a boatload of grieving hearts for interactive grief workshops, heart healing craft projects, Circles of Hope, and a beautiful candle at night of remembrance at sea. Request more information at comingbackcruise.com. You'll be contacted by the cruise's organizer and previous Coming Back podcast guest, Linda Finley, to hear more about your choice of two tropical cruises setting sail in 2020. And when you're ready, she'll help you reserve your spot on board. Bereavement cruise cabins do go quickly, so request more information now at comingbackcruise.com where grief finds support and community on the open sea. A well-known artist and author with more than one million books in print, Joanne Fink uses her Zenspirations brand to inspire people to use their creative talents to make a difference in the world. She shares her personal grief journey in her illustrated memoir, When You Lose Someone You Love. As a grief educator, Joanne is devoted to bringing comfort to the bereaved, as well as changing the culture of grief support in America. 
She creates commemorative art and develops products to help others navigate the grief process. Grief growers, I am so excited to introduce you to Joanne Fink, who is an artist that incorporates grief in her work. And I never, it's one of those things where I never associated with the art with the name until now. And receiving her words in my inbox, I was like, oh my goodness, this is the person that's been creating things related to grief that I've been looking at since the death of my mom, if not before, um, and really, really resonating with. So I'm so excited to have her here to tell her story of art and artwork, which is similar to heart work. And Joanne, if you could please share your lost story with us. My lost story started August 3rd of 2011 when my husband had a heart attack and died two days before our son turned 12, nine days before our daughter turned 17. And the life that I knew ended the day Andy died because in addition to being my husband, he was also my business partner, my IT director, finance officer, And I used to travel a lot for work, and he was primary kid care. He was my best friend, and most importantly, our children's father. And life as I knew it stopped, and I had to figure out how to move forward without him. And I remember in those early days, I was so dysfunctional. It was a good thing I had to get up to get the kids off to school, or I don't think I would have gotten out of bed. But as the weeks and months went on, you assimilate the loss, and you learn how to live without the person. The love is still there, and the grief is sometimes overwhelming. And what I used to do every morning is wake up, and I would write in a little moleskin journal when you lose someone you love, and then I would write how I felt about it that day. When you lose someone you love, There's a hole in your heart that nothing can fill. When you lose someone you love, you are forever changed. When you lose someone you love, some days just surviving is all you can do. And I did this for about 10 months. And it was a great way to heal. And I am a greeting card designer by profession. And... I uh, wound up incorporating pages from my personal grief journals into the book I wrote, When You Lose Someone You Love, which I think is a gift of comfort for other people who are grieving the loss of a loved one. And it's been more than eight years since Andy died, and not a day goes by that I don't think about him and miss him. And I try to live my best life as a tribute to him. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And I think the first place that I want to go, I'm taking notes as I listen to you, but um, Andy's role in your life, as with so many other people who lose spouses, is so much more than this is the person that I was married to. There's also these roles of business partner, child caregiver, IT director that were gone just with the snap of your fingers. And so I'm wondering kind of how you navigated, well, crap, I've got to outsource all these things all of a sudden and or take them on all by myself. It's a huge thing on top of grief. You know, it didn't occur to me to outsource any of them except I just knew I needed help. Andy and I were married for 29 years, and I never wrote a check before he died. We had a very traditional uh, 
division of labor in our household, meaning um, he did all the finance stuff and I did all the meal prep. Um, but we both worked in our business together and developed products for the stationary gift and craft industries. And I would travel to trade shows and meet with clients and he would man the home forts. And we had at one point in time, four graphic designers, an illustrator, a full-time crafter, and an office manager in addition to the two of us. And I am so blessed because I totally love what I do and love to wake up and put pen to paper. Um, but I don't have his gift for organization or tracking things. And we're not even going after the finance stuff. But the real surprise to me is that I was forced to learn a lot about technology. And while I'm not innately technical the way he was, I can now handle my own, at least in terms of uh, Macworlds and Apple stuff. Um, eventually, as I became more functional, I realized, you know, there were a lot of things that I didn't know how to do and some things that, you know, physically uh, or emotionally, I was not capable of doing on my own. And I have been blessed to be part of a really strong community and got so much support from people in my synagogue and people that I share the love of lettering with. I'm a calligrapher. You know, everybody cared. A lot of people didn't know how to show their support. And that's something that I am working on trying to change because knowing firsthand how devastating it is to lose someone you love and how people don't know what to say to us. I, I want to give the rest of the world tools to support those of us who are grieving. That's kind of the direction that I want to go into next, because the first tool that you leaned on for 10 months was writing in your moleskin. When you lose someone you love, dot, 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 fill in the blank. There's a hole in your heart. You are forever changed. Just surviving is all you can do. I kind of wonder, I'm getting chills as I ask this question, um, but I'm wondering where that initial desire came from, because I know so many grave growers who are listening to this episode, they're like, just give me somewhere to start. And having this prompt of when you lose someone you love, fill in the blank is so, it kind of, in a time when your mind is going everywhere, it kind of narrows your focus into, okay, what's the one thing I want to convey today about losing someone you love? So I'm wondering where that idea came from. And then the idea to turn it into the book when you lose someone you love? That's a wonderful question that I'm not sure I have an answer to. Um, you know, I process things by putting pen to paper as both a calligrapher and a greeting card writer and designer. I've spent 30 years writing text that calls to the soul, I guess. Um, I don't do humor myself. I just do inspirational uh, work. And it was so important for me to be able to process how I was feeling. I didn't realize that I was writing a book. At first, I was just surviving and getting my own feelings out onto paper. But I have 
I didn't really journal before Andy died, but I always wrote and lettered and doodled. So it was really, you know, second nature for me to go back to my roots of ink on paper. I will share that after he died, I did not pick up a pen for two months, which is the longest time that I have not picked up a pen, I think, ever, uh, since I first held crayons when I was a kid. Uh, And I think it's a sign of how totally shocked and dysfunctional I was. But journaling is a great tool for everybody to use to process how they feel. And I think writing down when you lose someone you love or even, you know, today I am grateful for or my heart is breaking because and using the same prompt over and over and over allows you to grow on your journey and see how you have changed. In the book, uh, it starts out black and white. And I added a little bit of color at the end. And I tried to make it a little bit more hopeful because after 10 months, I was a little bit more hopeful. I was not happy, but I was hopeful that the kids and I would be able to survive without Andy. And eight years down the road, I am pleased to report my children are amazing. My daughter just got her master's in speech and language pathology and has a job. And my son is in college and they are great kids. And so we are doing really well and we were not doing well at all for the first few years after Andy died so I celebrate the fact that um, we have been able to grow through grief and make that transition back towards living meaningful lives. I wonder being in the greeting card craft industry if there's anything about sympathy cards that are not yours that you like or dislike because I they're very divisive in the grief community sympathy cards are some people are like yes send me all of them that you can because I love hearing from my people and other people say don't send me a single sympathy card because those quotes are fake the inspirational messages just don't resonate with me or they're like this wrong societal message so early in loss of like, one day this will not be this way, or God never gives you more than you can handle, or things like that. So I wonder what your perspective is as someone in the field of other sympathy cards. Well, I think that there are some beautiful sympathy cards available. And I think there are some very mundane sympathy cards available. And the problem with sympathy cards in my mind is more related to how people use them, meaning when you know somebody has lost a loved one, you send them a sympathy card, and then you forget about them. And that's the part that is not okay with me. I got hundreds of cards after Andy died, and I couldn't tell you what a single one of them said. But about six weeks after he died, I got a card and a letter from a dear friend who lives out of state. And she said, I waited to send this because I knew you would be inundated with love and support for the first few weeks. And now that things have quieted down, I want you to know I'm here and I care. And that card meant the world to me because at that point, almost everybody else had gone back to their life. And I didn't have a life to go back to, you know, (laughs) I couldn't work without Andy. I was having trouble parenting well without Andy. 
I was having trouble sleeping without Andy. You know, my life was not functional. And the fact that somebody knew that and cared enough to send me a card, it wasn't even a sympathy card, uh, really meant so much. And I had another friend who sent me just to cheer me up note every month for the first six or seven months. And every time I saw, you know, her postmark, I knew there was at least one person who knew that my life was not functioning well and who cared. And I have taken that experience um, plus my years as a greeting card designer and writer. And I have come up with a line of what I call care emojis. They are emoji stickers available in the app store, 25 for 99 cents. And you can use them to reach out to somebody who's having a hard time. And the, you know, the care emoji collection uh, has things like checking in on you, holding you in my heart. I'm here and I care. Please take care of yourself, thinking of you and sending love. You know, it also has, you are not alone because I think the most important thing for people who are grieving and who really feel alone to know is that somebody cares. And that's why I call this collection Care Emoji. Um, but there are other, there's, you know, greet emojis and get well wishes. And I recently introduced uh, a new collection called Remembrance Emojis so that on the anniversary of loss, I can text my friends and say, holding you in my heart as you remember your son, your mother, your daughter, your husband. And I use them sadly almost every day because I know a lot of people who are grieving the loss of a loved one. And I think acknowledgement makes a big difference. So sympathy cards are fine, but I think what we, what we need is something ongoing that will allow people to show support in the weeks, months, and years after the loss. I love that notion because it's like it's supporting the supporters of people surrounding somebody who's grieving. There's so much out there that's grief support for the person who's grieving, but to have something out there for the supporters of someone who's grieving, like these little, um, care emojis you can put on your phone or remembrance emojis that you can send on a death anniversary or another hard day is really important. And also just like for, for you earlier in our interview to say, I had to learn how to be a techie person. And now for you to be developing emojis related to grief and remembrance, I'm like props to you <laughs> because you, I mean, just that significant amount of growth in eight years of, you know, I've never written a check all the way up to you know, now I'm developing things you can get in the app store for 99 cents that you can send to people who are, who are grieving. It's a, it's that, it's that growth through technology. I'm humored by that. I think that's really clever. And every time I do something super technical, I feel so proud. And I feel that Andy is looking down and beaming because I would never have had the opportunity to grow technically, if you were still here, because he always did that stuff for me. And it's one of those things I think that a lot of grievers will resonate with of, I'm grateful that this is happening and that this is real and that I've learned the skill, but also I would a thousand percent give it all back if he was alive. Absolutely. Yeah. So just honoring that both of those things can be equally true at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I want to segue into your creativity and your creative process, because you, you get the privilege of doing work that you love. And then you mentioned a little bit earlier that you're like, I didn't pick up a pen for two months after he died. And so I wonder how grief 
if grief changed your creative process or how you thought about the art that you were putting out into the world? I think a lot of things changed my creative process. One of them was embracing technology. I used to do everything by hand, and I would stand behind my designers and point and say, move that here, make that bluer, make that bigger. And after Andy died, um, and I had to learn Photoshop and other programs to do what I needed to do, um, it changed how I work. I now do a hybrid of I draw and I scan. I, I clean it up in Photoshop. I'll print it out on watercolor paper, paint it, scan it again, clean it up. And then I reformat a lot of my designs so that <clears throat> if I need a square version or a rectangular version, you know, I license my art for different products. And so when I have a design that touches hearts, it might be released as a mug, as a shirt, as a greeting card, as a print. And the way I've worked without Andy is very different because I'm hands on and I actually love it. You know, he used to take all the production responsibilities for anything that left the studio, not just my stuff, but the designers work as well. Uh, and I, I greatly enjoy the hybrid creative process. I got an iPad pro a couple years ago and have been doing a lot of work in my iPad, which is also really meaningful. But I think the other answer to your question is what I do, which is different. Um, because when you've had a life shattering loss, you look at the world differently. And I feel compelled to write and draw and talk about the loss. And part of it is I want to keep Andy's legacy alive. You know, one of, one of the many pieces that I've written, I think, says, time and distance cannot keep us apart. You've been etched into my soul and forever written onto the pages of my heart. And I did it with a book graphic and a winged heart and you know I did not know before Andy died that love is a force so powerful that it transcends death I have never I never lost anybody I was really close to before and I am not the same person that I was. I think that's really fitting. Of course, you would not be the same person that you were before he died. And I don't know that any of us is after loss. And again, it's like those two things being equally true at the same time. On one hand, it's absolutely devastating that we're not who we used to be. And on the other hand, we really have no choice but to be and become different people in the aftermath of loss. I wonder, with the work that you do in creating art that revolves around grief, you kind of also inadvertently create a container for other people to share their grief with you. So I wonder how that has not really influenced your work per se, not let, that you would create separate things for different people's stories, but what it's been like to be the recipient of other people's grief stories as a result of the work that you do. 
I lead a local widows group. And I mentioned earlier how important community was after Andy died. And I have wonderful friends and family and local community. But they didn't really get what I was going through. And they couldn't get what I was going through because it's not explainable. Grief is not something you can understand. You have to live through it. My daughter at one point in time uh, was trying to explain to her boyfriend how she felt on her dad's birthday. And she came home and she said, he just doesn't get it. I so wish he could understand how I felt. And then in the next breath, she said, but I would never want him to feel that way. So glad he has both his parents. And this went back and forth because you want the people you're closest to to understand the depth of your loss and the pain of your grief. But I believe that only somebody who is on their own grief journey can really understand on a visceral level. I like to encourage people who are grieving to find somebody who speaks their own loss language. As a widow, I mentor a lot of other widows. I also mentor people who have lost parents and children and friends and so forth. But at some point, my understanding of that loss is limited. You know, I don't know what my children have and continue to go through having lost their father because I am blessed to still have both of my parents. And one of the things that I wrote in the book was when you lose someone you love, you become more fearful because you're scared of losing other people that you love. And I feel that way about my parents and my children, um, you know, that I cannot imagine life without them, even though my parents are in their 80s. And I'm fond of saying nobody gets out of life alive. You know, death is a natural part of life. And grief is a natural part. It's a natural reaction to loss. So I like to connect with people who need to be with somebody who understands how devastated they are, especially in the first year or two when they're still shell-shocked. That's such a perfect way of phrasing it because I know that grief growers, some of you know that in a lot of the work I do, I convey this community, especially the community that meets regularly for grief support on Patreon, is just come to the group of people who just gets it. And it's this this notion of, yeah, we're all speaking the same language because we're all just this, I can't claim it to be an equal level of devastation, but grief is 100% for every single person that feels it. And so there's not really a comparison there, but yeah, to have people who can sit in the circle with you or have the phone call with you or even interact online with you and be like, yeah, this is the language that I need to speak. And this is the language that feels like, for lack of better phrasing, this feels like home right now. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really intensely powerful to be able to find your people in that sense. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I wonder, you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you've never really been in the humor space in terms of greeting cards at all, but I wonder if there's ever been anything funny with regard to your grief story or Andy's loss or creating all of these works when you lose someone you love in your other books and even the, the care emojis that struck you as really, really funny and grief. 
Andy had either the best or worst um, punster brain that that I <laughs> know. Um, and you know, you have to be able to laugh at yourself when grief hits us. Grief impacts every part of our lives. It's not just emotional. It hits us intellectually, spiritually, socially, physically. There's nothing, there's no part of us that is not impacted by grief. And, you know, the fourth time in 10 minutes that you put your keys down and you can't find them, you have to laugh and say, grief brain, we call it widow's brain. Widow's brain is a very real thing. There is a total lack of ability to concentrate, to remember. Part of that is because so many people struggle with sleep after loss. And the less you sleep, the harder it is to remember things especially when you get, you know, to be in your 50s, 60s and upwards. Um, sleep is a really restorative piece. But Andy was the humorist in the family, and so I don't really have any funny stories to share. I do like that pointing to grief brain though, because Lord knows I've done that too. And I, I vividly remember when Megan Devine came on coming back all the way back in season two, she told a story about putting her keys in the freezer. And it, it just is one of those things that like, this wouldn't be happening if I weren't grieving, but because it is, and because I am, there is some level of humor in it. So I love that that pointing to grief brain. And a lot of people do, yes, call it widow's brain or widow fog as well. And so just honoring that that is true in grief. Absolutely. I think uh, the direction I want to go next is related to others being creative in the aftermath of loss, because I think things like journaling or drawing or painting or doodling are conveyed as really wonderful ways to process grief because for the most part, aside from journaling, they're not really verbal. So you don't have to use that that left hemisphere. You can use that right brain, which is a lot more emotional and feeling and sensing. Um, but what do you have to say to grievers who are like, I wasn't any good at this before my person died. How am I possibly going to be any good at this now that they've died? So the point of journaling and coloring and putting pen to paper has nothing to do with the end results. It has to do with the mindfulness practice that comes from focusing on a tiny little area of your paper and a prompt of some kind. I teach a workshop called Color, Creativity, Grief, and Gratitude because I think grief is a journey. And I've given this workshop quite a number of times, including at Camp Widow, which is a wonderful resource for newly widowed people and further along widowed people that is run by the Soaring Spirits Loss Foundation. And it's a way of connecting um, with other people who speak your loss language. <clears throat> um, but one of the things that you can do when you put pen to paper after loss, you know, grief is a catalyst for growth and gives you the opportunity to explore things you might never have done before this life-shattering loss. And it also gives you the opportunity to express how you feel. You don't need to show it to anybody. 
you know, it does not matter. You're not trying to create a masterpiece, although I, I do like to think that most people are capable of drawing a lot better than they think they are. And I have a lot of videos on YouTube under Zenspirations where I teach people how to draw and how to pattern. And I love the letters I get that say, thank you for teaching me how to draw something I'm proud of. They really touch my heart. But I have a special passion for helping the bereaved find a spark of creative satisfaction after loss. And we all have different forms of creativity. And I think seeking beauty of whatever, you know, for some of us, it comes through music. For some, it comes through dance. For some, it comes through art. Uh, but whatever your form of creative expression is, making time and space to allow yourself to grow creatively, to give yourself permission not just to play and experiment, but also to fail. We learn as much from our failures as we do from our successes. And, you know, Brene Brown talks about imperfection. Nobody is perfect and nobody has a perfect life. And being accepting of where you are in your journey and what you're capable of doing. You know, I only started drawing Zenspirations 10 years ago. And I invented this art form, if you will, because I didn't know how to draw. I was a really good lettering artist, and I knew how to letter and do calligraphy. But I couldn't draw anything. And after drawing almost every day for the past 10 years, I can draw. It's uh, quite astonishing and quite enriching. And so I think being willing to explore your own innate creative gifts is something I encourage everybody to do. That's so important to me as somebody who's held an identity of a creative person for her whole life to be able to explore my creative gifts now that I'm grieving. And I just want to send a message to other grief growers out there that part of exploring your creative gifts is acknowledging that you even have them in the first place. And I think so much of that is just realizing that all humans are creative in their own ways. It doesn't, it just doesn't all look the same, which I'm frankly grateful for because then we'd all be dressed the same and, you know, we'd have the same art in our house and all architecture would look the same. I mean, all of these things. So, um, and I love that you touched on this notion of being good at it's not the point. And I think, especially if for grief growers who've read my book, Permission to Grieve, will know that grief is an entity that's alive, that like wants to work with us, but it doesn't really pass judgment on on what it makes about what it puts out into the world. And that's not really what it wants. That's like a world thing to put the gold medal or the gold star or like the, you know, the prestigious award on top of it. But um, I think grief just wants to show up and make stuff. And that's so important. And then to your point too, that it's a skill. It's, you know, all of a sudden after 10 years of doing this, it's not all of a sudden I can draw, but I've been doing it for 10 years. But just like grief, that practice of creativity is a skill that, that comes with repetition and focus. And the word that's coming to me right now is devotion for you. Yes. Yeah. When people tell me that they are not creative, I gently correct them because like you, I believe everybody is creative. We are born to create. What they usually mean is they're not artistic and their form of creativity. Andy 
used to tell me he was a very creative programmer. I have no way of judging since, although I'm more technical these days, I don't program. Um, but I believe that he was a very creative computer programmer. He was a software engineer by training, and he loved it. And my next book, which is called My Spiritual Journey, is a guided journal to help people discover who they are, what their innate gifts are, what they're passionate about, what they value, and use that information to discover their unique purpose in the world and then set intentions to fulfill their purpose. And it's something that I wrote in part for my grief communities, especially my widows, because one of the things that happens is you need to rediscover who you are after loss. Because I used to be part of Joanne and Andy, all one syllable were. I used to be part of Joanne and Andy, you know, all one phrase, and trying to figure out who Joanne is without Andy continuing to be here and a physical part of my life has been quite a journey. This sounds like the perfect place to let all of our listeners know where they can find you and all of your books and all of your art as well. Well, you can find my books on Amazon. Uh, You can find my art in my Etsy shop. Uh, if you Google Zenspirations, you'll find things. But I have two websites, one for Zenspirations, which is zenspirations.com. And then the other is when you lose someone.com. And there's a lot of resources on the When You Lose Someone site that I think will be helpful, both if you're supporting someone on their grief journey or if you are grieving the loss of someone you love. And I so want to let everybody know, grief is a very, very long process, and support is needed for far longer than you can imagine if you have not lost someone you love. But wherever you are on your journey, you are not alone. Joanne, I'm just so thrilled to have shared space here with you today. I think that the art surrounding grief, the art of sympathy cards, <laughs> is is so vitally important. And yet, this conversation doesn't always get to happen in other spaces. So thank you so much for sharing time with me today here on Coming Back. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. I am a big fan of the work that you're doing. It's so needed. So that's all for this episode of Coming Back. Thank you so very much to Jillian Fink for joining us on Coming Back to talk about sympathy cards, creativity, and the trickiness and humor of taking on household and logistical roles after the death of a spouse. Joanne came back by giving herself a journaling prompt, when you lose someone you love, dot dot dot, making art exclusively for grieving hearts, and by providing herself with grace and humor as she learned the roles that her husband used to fill in her life. You can find Joanne's books, art, and care emojis at zenspirations.com and her grief work at whenyoulosesomeone.com, and you can find both of those links in the show notes for this episode. If you're looking for more grace, space, and room to breathe in the aftermath of loss, pick up a copy of my new book, Permission to Grieve, now on Amazon. If you're looking for more grace, space, and room to breathe in the aftermath of loss, purchase a copy of my new book, Permission to Grieve, now on Amazon. And remember, if you'd like to listen to the book, you can get it for free when you sign up as a new customer on Audible. You can find a link to Permission to Grieve in the show notes. 
to keep this little grief podcast going, and to receive insider bonuses like weekly grief journaling prompts, podcast swag, and live grief support with me. Pledge to support the show at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. If you liked what you heard today, subscribe to Coming Back on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and tell a friend about this podcast, because you never know what someone you love is going through. Thank you to Addie Goldstein, who composed our theme music. You can find me on Facebook at Shelby Forsythia Intuitive Grief Guide, Instagram at Shelby Forsythia, or simply shelbyforsythia.com. As always, my dear grief growers, it was beautiful sharing this space and time with you today. I see you. I'm proud of you and the work that you're doing in the world. And I love you. Because even through grief, we are growing. <laughs>